and um, four score, and then some years ago, our, our forefathers and mothers uh, built a nation presumably based on the principle that all human beings are created equal. Now, from time to time throughout uh, this country's history, we have, uh, there have been movements that have attempted to reinvigorate the notion that we should be a nation of, uh, built on achievement through merit rather than achievement through inherited or uh, otherwise uh, illegitimately conferred privilege. Now, how are we doing on that score? Uh, our next guest, I suspect, has some thoughts about it. In fact, I know so from his writing. We're always delighted to talk to him. Nathan J. Robinson is a commentator. He is an attorney. He is a scholar. And he is an editor and publisher of the magazine Current Affairs, which I always enjoy and appreciate and get a lot out of. So without further ado, Nathan, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you so much for that extremely flattering introduction. <laughs> well, I'll try to do better next time. Um, all right. Speaking of meritocracy, uh, yeah. you have a piece out, just came out uh, as we speak uh, in The Guardian. Um, meritocracy is a myth invented by the rich. Now, of course, this is, uh, in, I shouldn't say of course, but this is in response to the college admissions scandal, which we, like everyone else, have been talking about. Uh, what a teaching moment that is, first of all, right? It is, it is a remarkable story. I mean, you can understand why people are fascinated by it. I mean, it involves famous people. It involves just, you know, colossal fraud, um, you know, fabricating uh, learning disabilities, uh, the photoshopping of students so that they could pretend they were world-class athletes and get in on athletic scholarships to prestigious schools. It is a pretty stunning case, but... Uh, only the tip of the iceberg of unfairness that characterizes the American education system, alas. Yes, and I, I, I mean, you make that point, and, and it's a very valid point. Uh, but the, it also, before we get into that, uh, the fact that the entire system is, is structured unfairly and sort of perpetuates... Uh, the worst kind of insular elite. I mean, I'm sort of tipping my hand there on my opinion, I guess. But uh, before we even get to that, it, w it is worth lingering for a moment on the mm. fact that, that we are talking in this case about very wealthy people who clearly are influential people who clearly felt that uh, they could commit uh, fraud and bribery. Yeah. Uh, and get away with it. The, the, the sense of yeah. impunity that these people had is really, for one thing, quite striking. Yeah, this is a, this is a stunning case of just outright criminality and fraud. Uh, the guy Rick Singer, who is sort of the mastermind behind this uh, this company that would accept basically just giant piles of money from the tens of thousands to sometimes the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and would basically ask you, well, where do you want to get your kids into school? And they would tell them, well, we want them to go to Georgetown or the University of Southern California or Yale. And they would say, well, let's see what we can do. And whether that was helping the kids cheat on standardized tests by say, faking learning disabilities or whether it was the sports scholarships or whether it was uh, you know, transcript manipulation. Uh, there were dozens of different ways in which it would just, and, and bribing college officials at so many different colleges who were accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars to conspire in this fraud. So it's a vast conspiracy of, of fraud, but driven by these parents who would do anything, I mean, really anything, like risk prison risk to get their children into the right school. Well, and let's talk about that for a second, because I think that's something people haven't reflected enough on, is that there was a sense of desperation, determination, whatever you want to call it, but you had these people who, just by dint of their very existence and wealth, the head of the Massimo brand, the, uh, uh, you know, to the two of the most uh, well-known actors in the country, uh, 
co-managing partner of one of the largest and most prestigious law firms in the country. On and on, these extremely wealthy and influential people <clears throat> seem to feel <clears throat> that their children's lives would be perpetually impoverished no matter how many millions they were able to leave to them, not, no matter how many doors they can open through them through their personal and professional connections. They clearly believe that if their children did not go to the elite, most elite possible uh, um, educational institution that somehow they would be bagging groceries for the rest of their lives or something. I don't know, but what do you think was behind this sense of desperation? One of, one of the strange things about wealth is that it, there is this <laughs> strong sense among, not among all of the wealthy, but it's pervasive among the, the extremely wealthy, that nothing is ever enough, that no matter how much money you have, you are always on the verge of poverty. I mean, I went to uh, law school at Yale, and so I, the people I was with were all going to be guaranteed of good jobs for the rest of their lives. But they were, and many of them came from extreme wealth, but they would always talk, they were so worried about were they ever going to get a job? How are they going to survive? You know, and you think, uh, you know, how are you going to survive in New York and only $100,000 a year, for example? And it's, it's. I mean, it's endemic. And there, there are reasons for this. I mean, uh, Robert Frank, his name is the economist who, who has uh, talked about positional goods and mm -hmm. the way in which uh, you measure your success relative to those around you. It's not an objective uh, measure of worth. It's a measure, it's positional. So if if I'm, it's a keeping up with the Joneses thing at the highest possible level. If I'm not doing as well as the next billionaire, then I am poor. Uh, because that's what I have to compare myself to. And so their children would be failing if their neighbors got their children into slightly better schools. Right. No, I think the, the, the positional aspect of it is really important. And, you know, there's also, and not that uh, I'm going to be shedding tears for these folks <clears throat> necessarily, but there's also, I remember I was on a, um, a panel or something with a sociologist, Dalton Conley, who uh, has written a lot about the perpetual anxiety of the of the financial elite in in Manhattan. That there's always the same thing. I think there's always a slightly better apartment. They're always they feel they have to physically be present in the office 75 hours a week, or people won't think they're working hard enough. So there's a sort of symbolic presentation they have to go through all the time. So there is, in a sense, this sort of internalized madness, I guess, which I suppose one could be compassionate. I could be more compassionate about. A, if I didn't realize that it led to sort of predatory, nonstop predatory behavior, and B, if I didn't realize that this is the mentality of the people who still, to an enormous extent, rule our political and cultural <clears throat> and economic lives, right? I do have some compassion for the children who grow up in wealthy environments because I think oftentimes it it can it can be miserable. There's this incredible book and accompanying documentary called Generation Wealth by Lauren Greenfield and she's documenting the lives of the super rich in America. And one of the cases that she picks is a guy who calls himself the timeshare king and he's building a McMansion in Orlando that's the largest private home in America is 90,000 square feet with a 10,000 square foot master bedroom. But his teenage daughter is about 17 years old and she thinks the whole thing is ridiculous. Um, but she becomes addicted to drugs and then she overdoses and the tragic part of the book is that she dies. Um, and then Mr. Timeshare King is devastated, but it doesn't cause him to rethink at all like how the environment in which his daughter grew up may have been destructive. And, you know, oftentimes the children of the wealthy, uh, it could be really screwed up because this kind of, these kinds of values, this kind, they're not good for you. And um, I, so I do, I do have some sympathy there, but at the same time, as you say, uh, this is, this is really, really destructive. Um, you can understand it. The other way you can understand it a little bit is, it's not just positional goods. It's also the fact that in the United States, it is to a certain degree, Agree true that if you lose everything, you can lose everything. You can lose your health care. There's no, there's no net to catch people, right? We don't really have that much of a safety net. So 
people's worries about having everything wiped out. We, in the financial crisis, plenty of people did have uh, you know, wealth wiped out. The, the creative destruction of capitalism, you never know who's going to be next. Well, that's certainly true. And again, we're talking with Nathan J. Robinson of Current Affairs. And, you know, it, it, there, there are so many dimensions to this. And one of, of course, the system that produces this exaggerated wealth is also the system that eliminates the safety net. If you lose the exaggerated wealth, so that's number one. And number two is, you know, it seems to me, as you say, meritocracy is a myth. We've sort of suspected that for a long time. This is more validation of it. But also the notion of meritocracy itself, mm -hmm. I think needs to be seriously <clears throat> challenged, uh, interrogated, as they say in the academy, uh, but challenged. I, I think the notion that we've lived with, and that is basically part of, if you want to call it the neoliberal construct, or however you want to look at it, is basically the really talented people are going to emerge from the undifferentiated masses and through a system of competitive weaning through education, those few who survive uh, and make it through the marathon, uh, the educational marathon, make it to the most elite schools and from the elite schools get the best grades and from the best grades and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's how society should be governed so that, it, it, you know, and that would posit that the only difference between that meritocracy and aristocracy is that aristocracy is inherited, this meritocracy is earned through competition, but maybe we need to get away from the notion of meritocracy too and say, you know, we don't need a small number of competitively winnowed elites uh, like the Hunger Games or something ruling us. What we really need is uh, a more democratic, uh, less hierarchical, more lateral system of, uh, of governing for ourselves. I don't know. What do you think? There's this in, there's this idea that there's this phrase equality of opportunity that people talk about who believe in meritocracy but say that well yes we recognize that the situation is unfair obviously very few people I think would disagree with the statement that wealthy people have uh, some advantages or uh, that there are there are disadvantages in society but if we just had equal opportunity um, then a meritocracy would be okay. Um, this is how they distinguish themselves from those of us who are the sort of democratic leftists who say, well, e equality of opportunity is so, so far from what we have. And I think the very concept of equality of op having like equal opportunity and then a meritocracy uh, really needs to be examined because if you think about what it would actually take to have meaningful equality of opportunity where the people who rose to the top had competed on an even playing field and then they'd won because of their merit. Uh, you'd really have to start with communism, right? Because you'd have to start with um, parents not having different amounts of wealth that they could use to give their children advantages. So everyone would have to have the same amount of wealth with their parents. Um, you'd have to start by abolishing borders, right? Because the people well, you're, right. you're, the place that you were born shouldn't give you any advantages over anyone else. Um, you, it would be so, so radical to have anything resembling equal opportunity that produced anything resembling a system where people who had the most merit rose to the top because they had won a fair fight. There's no way to make this everyone's always going to inherit whether you know whether even genetically or or whether no matter how where you come down on the nature versus nurture debate both of those things are the accident of circumstance and imagining what it would take to have fair competitions you see how radical that notion is so that's why i think we should get away from the entire idea of meritocracy and start thinking well how do we just guarantee everyone uh, access to and the ability to have the highest possible education. And how do we make sure that you don't have to compete with other people? Because when you have competitions, it's not going to be fair. There's unfairness built into that. Well, to which I would only add that, you know, the, the cliche of that equality of opportunity uh, framing is we need a level playing field, but a level mm -hmm. playing field assumes that it's a game. And a, a, a game with winners and losers. And perhaps instead of thinking of a small number of winners and a large number of losers, we should start thinking about how we do things as a community. And mm -hmm. so that to me, 
And this, to me, by the way, is the perfect segue to the other but closely related topic I wanted to talk to you about, which was your piece I appreciated quite a bit, entitled The Obama Boys. Uh, mm -hmm. The Memoirs of White House Staffers uh, is the subhead. And in this case, I don't believe that your editor overruled you on either the the headline or the <laughs> subheading, because it's your own magazine. Uh, the Memoirs of White House Staffers show us how not to do politics. I um, I feel that the Obama administration, you know, whatever the positive qualities it had, and I don't mean to, you know, just condemn it to, you know, the trash heap of history, but uh, I feel that it was almost the final flowering of a sort of a, of what we're talking about, uh, a, a, a notion, a, cons a worldview that may have passed its time, a worldview that says the finest among you will will through the series of you know screening processes make it to the top and run the world it didn't turn out that well so first of all what do you think of my fundamental premise my linking of these two subjects well it's it's funny my colleague luke savage wrote this article uh, on the way that this tv show the west wing can tell us right. uh, a lot about uh, this style of politics and if you think about the west wing it is an environment where you had supposedly the best the best and the brightest right, right. the the young the 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 guys who went to good school, and they are all guys, they're all all the top people in the West Wing, they're all white guys who went to good schools, and they sit in a room together, and they make good politics happen through their brilliance and their wit. And it's interesting because you see kind of that perspective on politics in the Obama administration. In David Litt's memoir, he says that when he got onto the speechwriting team, the entire speechwriting team was young white men, and they'd all gone to good schools, and they'd all got the, the most prestigious schools. So, and the, and, the, and the very mentality that Luke Savage critiques about the West Wing is so present in these memoirs, where it really is this absence of popular movements, this absence of a diverse group group of voices from all walks of life, all parts of the economy. It is a sense that we get the smartest people, we get the best people, and then they do the politics. And surprise, surprise, they all turn out to be white men from Yale. <laughs> yeah, just randomly selected from the population as a whole. So, well, see, to me, there, 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 there are a lot of dimensions to this, but one of them, and the West Wing, I think the tying in with the West Wing mentality is, is perfect, but I think that what goes along with that is a kind of circular emotional logic on the part of the participants that says, we are here because we are the best. Therefore, uh, whatever we feel comfortable doing at the moment is not a reflection of our culture, our history, our insular worldview, but is a reflection of the fact that we are the best. Therefore, what we feel inclined to do is the best thing to do. Do you get what I'm trying to it's say? Oh, it's stunning, actually, because when you read these memoirs, if you consider that Donald Trump is now the president, you might think that that would give some sign to these guys that they probably screwed something up somewhere, right? Because it ended in catastrophe. But it's interesting because there's some there's some self-reflection in the book a little bit, but it's an interesting kind of self-reflection because Ben Rhodes says he and Obama are sitting down thinking about what went wrong. And they go, well, you know, what if what if we were wrong? And you think, yes, what if you were wrong? Right. But then he says, what if people just wanted to lapse back into tribalism and our noble aspiration of a better politics was you know, rejected by the sort of the ho the, the 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 baying horde out in middle America? Uh, you know, what if people? What if? What if we were too good for this right, country? Right. Right. It's basically the extent of their self-reflection, and in their defenses, they basically treat it as well. We did the best we possibly could. It, it, given the circumstances we had. And they're not really open to the idea that, well, maybe you didn't do the best that you could. Maybe actually you made some really bad decisions. Well, and that, <clears throat> that of course, we're seeing playing out in agonizing real time 
in politics today as we as we cue ourselves up for the 2020 election nathan j robinson we, we're seeing in i feel on the democratic side and you know, maybe a little bit of posturing on the republican side but on the democratic side i feel is that we're seeing a sort of re like these dark forces from 2016 are summoning themselves again and we're seeing a kind of uh replay uh of uh, challenge th this sort of this insider worldview that's very prevalent within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Thomas Frank, who's been on the show several times, uh, you know, has written about this a lot. The Democratic Party being the party of the ten percent rather than the one percent. The professional class is looking down at the ninety percent who are not in the professional class, and so on. But uh, we're seeing now some candidates, and certainly a lot of social commentary and political commentary uh, and many political and policy consultants who represented, for lack of a better word, this establishment view. And, and they, they are still sort of holding their noses at, uh, metaphorically, I assume, at uh, the insurgents who are crowding into the tent, whether it's the uh, Ilan Omars and Rashida Tlaibs and and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whether it's Bernie uh, Sanders a, 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 at the presidential level, whether it's all their supporters and followers and allies, but we're really seeing a kind of the Obama boys and their broader clique uh, be, starting to be arrayed, I think, I was hoping this wouldn't happen, but I think it is, against uh, the more populist forces in the Democratic Party as we roll into 2020. Do you think so? Well, we'll see how successful that is. I mean, I, I agree. I see the same tendencies. I mean, Beto O'Rourke just declared his candidacy today. And you see exactly the tendencies that I highlight in David Litt's autobiography in the Beto O'Rourke approach to politics, because he says, I'm not running against anything. This is what he says. I'm not running against anything. I. But then when you ask him what he's for, he's very, very vague on policy details. He says, I want to bring Americans together. Partisan division is ruining the country. And what you see is these same kind of form over substance politics, where it's about having, you know, a, a charismatic and witty and Kennedy-esque figure uh, that through their very brilliance will transform the country. And that's extremely troubling. I don't know how successful it's going to be because I think a lot of, oh, a lot of voters looked at 2016 uh, Hillary versus Bernie and came away thinking, well, I, I think if you ran that race the same way today, it wouldn't come out the same because I think a lot of people think, well, maybe the politics that seemed like pragmatism was actually kind of vacuous um, because it's not really pragmatism if you don't succeed in getting anything done. And I think it's been become quite clear that a politics where you talk in uplifting rhetoric about bipartisanship in a political environment where the Republican Party wants to destroy the left and everything that progressivism stands for, a bipartisan politics of compromise and uplift isn't actually going to get anything. It can't, there's no, there's no even theoretical way that it can produce positive steps towards a more progressive country. Yeah, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, that viewpoint is as naive as the peace protesters who would put flowers in the barrels of soldiers' guns. You know, that's all very well and good until they decide to fire. And the Republicans have been, uh, you know, very uh, militaristic in their, as you just say, in their attitude to the left for a long time. What's, and I talk about that a lot, actually, on this show, that the so-called pragmatists are actually the ones without a practical theory of change. Because, in my view, because at least the the the, the new left uh, forces within the Democratic Party say we, we're going to have to come up with a politics that's so compelling and popular that Republicans won't control the Senate, they won't get the House back. We'll have some of the lower houses in the, at the state level as well, and we can do some of the things that people really need. Well, that whether you agree or not, that's a theory of change, whereas the so-called pragmatists, the Joe Biden, Beto, 
Hillary crowd say, well, we've got to come up with some policies that we can get Mitch McConnell and his people to sign on to. That's never going to happen. So they actually, ha they don't want to win the Senate. That's not part of their theory. Uh, obviously, they do want to win it, but they, they don't argue that's, that their premise is we can work with the Republicans. Well, Republicans won't work with you. So I argue that they're the fantasists and the fabulists on the political scene right now. Sometimes I even wonder whether they do want to win. I mean, one of the cr criticisms of you know, both Beto and, and Joe Biden have uh, voiced this, given voice to this kind of compromise politics, and both of them have essentially campaigned for Republican candidates who defeated their Democratic challenges. Joe, Joe Biden gave a $200,000 speech for a Republican. Beto O'Rourke went on a road trip with a Republican congressman. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, there really isn't a sense that you're in a fight trying to win, which I don't don't see how there's any pragmatism to that. If you don't want the Democratic Party to advance its interests, then you are not a practical uh, messenger for the for the Democratic Party. You're not you're not actually going to get anything, as I say. And you see this naivete throughout these memoirs, where you know Ben Rhodes is wondering why, uh, if Obama gives Benjamin Netanyahu uh, as many concessions as possible, Netanyahu won't do anything for him in return. Obama Obama wonders why Republicans, at one point, he wonders why Republicans won't show up to his movie screening of Lincoln, where he wants to teach them about working together to achieve things. And you go, because they want to destroy you, that's why. And it's there's nothing practical about not recognizing that. And you need to instead, I, they and they have this other thing that they do where they accept political reality as fixed. Uh, they went to Joe Lieberman and uh, tried to get a public option and Joe Lieberman said, I won't vote for it. And then they went, oh, well, okay, Joe Lieberman won't vote for it, so we can't get it. Instead of thinking, well, how do we make it so that Joe Lieberman votes for us? How do we twist his arm? How do we give some sort of inducement or threat? Um, it's like, well, interests are aligned against us, so there's nothing we can do. There's no sense of like, well, you build movements, you build power, and you use that power to change the political reality like Bernie Sanders has. Well, I, I certainly agree with you there because at the time I wrote a piece called If Joe Lieberman Didn't Exist, They Would Have Had to Invent Him. And that I, I, I felt he was actually a convenient excuse not mm -hmm. to do something they didn't want to do in the first place. And I think right. in a sense... I think in a sense we're back to the sociological dimension of this in that if, when you've been in power as long as some of these folks have or when you've craved being in the inner circle for so long as some of the uh, you know Obama-like characters have been, including Obama, I would argue, then uh, the, the, the sort of lateral group bonding of uh, you know being your, your sense of kinship with uh, a Republican senator, fellow senator, becomes greater than your sense of kinship or, or member of Congress, becomes greater than your sense of allyship with that Democrat running to unseat them, for example. And so I think that's what we see with Joe Biden. I think that's what we see with Beto O'Rourke, who took his cross-country driving trip with a Republican uh, member of Congress as a uh, publicity stunt and then basically campaigned for that guy against his Democratic opponent. It's basically a way of saying to the Democratic base and to the public at large, uh, you know, my sense of kinship with these other powerful people is greater than my sense of kinship with you. Well, he, speaking of Joe Biden, I mean, in his case, it's sometimes appalling, right? I mean, he spoke uh, very fondly of senators like Jesse Holmes and Strom Thurmond. He gave a eulogy at Strom Thurmond's funeral. Strom Thurmond, who was, he was a white supremacist. He founded the Dixiecrats, right? He's a truly heinous human being. Um, and, and Joe Biden's paying warm tribute, and he's saying, well, we may have disagreed on this and that, but at the the end of the day, we could respect one another, and you go, you can't have any respect for white supremacy because to respect that is to disrespect the humanity of people of color. So there is a question, that old labor question, which side are you on? I absolutely, is yeah. It's truly important, and you have to have the right answer to that question when it comes down to it. So I got to tell you a quick story, and then I'll give you the last word. I went to a funeral of someone who had been, you know, gotten well known from the state of Arkansas. And the person who gave the eulogy was one of the most corrupt, 
insiders like selling access to the Lincoln bedroom type of Clinton Democrats. But he gave a lovely eulogy. And I think that's yes. what uh, that's what that kind of relationship <clears throat> seduces people like Joe Biden. So I went up to the guy afterwards and I said, that was a beautiful eulogy. And I found you very likable, but I want you to know I've devoted my career to destroying people like you. I appreciated the eulogy. When I go back home tomorrow, I'm going to go back to what I was doing before, which is trying to destroy people like you. And he looked me in the eye and he said, why, thank you. And, <laughs> you know, okay, you can do it, right? You could say on a personal level, these can be charming people when you're in the Senate cloakroom or whatever. But if you don't acknowledge that they're what we're fighting against, then I think you've lost your reason for being in a political sense. But I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I, I mean, look at Diane Feinstein with the with the children, right? Where she says to the children, "Well, I've been in the Senate several decades. I know that this is just not going to happen. We're not going to fix the climate in ten years." And you think, "Well, I'm sorry, but that's that's a suicidal position, and you don't, you can't. You, we have to change that. If that's the political reality, then your commitment needs to be, well, how do we take this on? I'm sorry if these people are your friends. I'm sorry." if they are intransigent, but they've got to go and we've got to figure out because the issues are too important. The human consequences are too urgent. Yes. Can one imagine Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying in 1940, yes, we know the Nazis are a big threat, but I know how things work in this town and you can't defeat them in five years. Uh, un unthinkable. So, all right. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But Nathan J. Robinson, editor and publisher of Current Affairs and so much more. Uh, as always, a great pleasure talking with you, my friend. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much, Roger.